Today reminds me of a 4th of July weekend took place about 10 years ago. It was a special Sunday. Uh, it was a Sunday up at East Lake United Methodist Church when we were going to be receiving our new pastor, Jay Kowalski, after Pastor Bob was reappointed to St. Paul. So you were uh, meeting Pastor Bob that day for the first time as we welcomed Jay to Eastlake. At the time, uh, I wasn't a ministry candidate yet. I was thinking about it, but I was the chairman of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, and the Staff Parish team does a lot to try to facilitate the uh, reappointment, the departure of one pastor, and welcoming a new pastor. And we were trying to put our best foot forward for that Sunday, which happened to be the 3rd of July, when Pastor Jay would preach his first sermon at Eastlake. And so we had worked really hard to prepare all the other aspects of worship that week so he could see that we were a church on the ball. We also had just hired on our staff at that time a young woman who was new to working in the church, and she was the communications person who put all the information that appeared on the screens and such up for us to use and all the backgrounds, kind of like she would have been the person who picked the photo of the boy standing and looking out on the mountains back in those days. Well, at that time at uh, East Lake, after the uh, Apostles' Creed was recited together in church, the church sang a very sacred hymn called the Gloria Patri. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, the words go, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen, amen. And when that's sung, it's very typical for the choir, wherever they are situated, for the pastors and the liturgists to all face the altar table or the cross, depending on what the church looks like. And it's an incredibly solemn moment. So imagine my jaw-dropping chagrin as I looked up on the screen as we were singing the very solemn Gloria Patri to see a video of a million colorful fireworks exploding. And all I could see in front of me, I was serving as the liturgist that day, and I could see Pastor Jay and his new appointment trying very hard to suppress a grin, but fortunately his back was to the con congregation. But you know, it's 10 years later now, and I think back about the day, and I wonder, why in the world was I so concerned? What are the words that we sing when we, when we sing that song? I mean, world without end, life everlasting, Glory to the Father and Son and Spirit. Surely that is worthy of celebration, even joyful, exuberant celebration. And too often we get caught up in these postures as we celebrate this everlasting life and the gift that comes with being a person born again in Christ. We, we treat it solemn. And, and of course it is a solemn thing, but it's something that's worthy of great celebration, which is why for this message series, which began last week, we selected the photo that you're seeing behind me on the screen. That is a photo of one of our students on a day when they go to a mountaintop, I won't even call it a hilltop, up in North Carolina while they're at Teen Valley Ranch, and this young man has his arms raised in joyful recognition of the beautiful creation before him, of what's happening in his life there at Teen Valley Ranch. And that's the way I hope we will learn to approach each and every day. Some of our secular holidays, like Fourth of July, are on the calendar for one day a year. But the freedom we find in Jesus is what we're talking about now because it coincides with that holiday, but also as a reminder that the greatest freedom of all is something that we can give special thanks for each and every day. 
And we began this message series last week by focusing on the letter F in free, which stands for formation. And I talked to you about how each and every one of us has the free will and is given the opportunity to make a choice whether we will become disciples of Jesus and whether we will live and learn each and every day in a way that will allow us to grow as disciples. Well, today we're going to turn to the letter R in free. And R today stands for redeemed because that's what we are. And that is worthy of celebration in addition to our celebration of Independence Day. Now, I don't know what you think about, but when I think about redeemed, the first thing that comes to mind is a gift card. I go to a restaurant, I have a delicious meal, and when the server comes to get my credit card, instead, I give him or her a gift card that was given to me by someone. I didn't have to pay for it, For me, it's a free meal, but the meal wasn't really free because someone else paid for the gift card. It's kind of like our Thanksgiving food basket distribution. How many of you have ever volunteered when we handed out turkeys and food at Thanksgiving time? I see many of you in the room I know who have helped with that. And on that day, families who are struggling a little bit come to St. Paul and they receive a turkey and and a box filled with produce and potatoes and mashed potato mix and stuffing mix and they give us a card to show they were registered to receive that. Now they didn't have to pay for that card. The food was free to them but the food wasn't free to the ministry. Many of you donated it, either money or food, so that we could provide that for others. They benefited, our families benefited from Something that they didn't pay for, but somebody else did. You know, too often when we think about our redemption, we treat it like it's that very special card that you want to draw from the pile when you play Monopoly. How many of you have played Monopoly? We've all played Monopoly. You know the card I'm talking about. Get out of jail free. Too often we think of our redemption that way. But friends, our redemption wasn't free. It was paid for by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we need to always remember that this gift we're given is something we don't deserve, we haven't earned, but it was given to us because the trust, obedience, and love of the Father's one and only beloved Son. And by virtue of his sacrifice, we share in his resurrection. So today we're going to continue to look at this subject of freedom by studying the book of Romans. Last week we were looking primarily at chapter 6. Today I'm going to turn to chapter 8 and read selective verses from verses 1 through 16. This is what Paul wrote. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. We are God's children, like the little brothers and sisters of God's one and only begotten son. We are adopted into the family and justified because what of what Jesus did. No condemnation for us, even though we continue to be sinners. Sin can still cause us to behave in ways that we shouldn't, but we know at the other side of that sin, 
there is forgiveness found for those who claim Jesus as Lord. And this claiming of Jesus as Lord leads to everlasting life. And this, this passage gives meaning to that church term I used last week, justifying grace. God looks to us and says, these are my righteous people because I am going to look at the righteousness of my son and I'm going to see them through eyes that see them just as righteous. And that is a very, very great gift. But once again, we're called upon to exercise our free will. We can accept Christ's sacrifice for us and claim him and profess him as our Lord or not. It's a choice that we make at various times in our life. Sometime for a young person, it's made at confirmation. Sometimes for someone who wasn't confirmed, it's made later in life. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But accepting Christ means we accept him as our personal savior. We accept him as the Lord of all creation. And this is an important concept coming up here. We accept him as the king of kings. That means the king over all other rules and authorities, even the ones we choose to govern our, govern our cities, our counties, our state, and our nation. He is the king of kings to whom our primary allegiance is owed if we profess him as our personal savior. But this doesn't mean that suddenly when we accept Jesus as Lord that our life is without trouble. It doesn't mean that we won't have any more challenges or difficulties. It doesn't mean that life will just be a field filled with wildflowers and butterflies. Because we continue to live in a broken world where many people do not profess Jesus as Lord and where people's primary allegiance is given knowingly or subconsciously to someone or something else than Jesus Christ. You see, we struggle about what it means to be redeemed because sometimes we expect being redeemed to mean that life should be trouble-free, and it doesn't. Life in a free country like America gives us lots of things to celebrate and enjoy, the right to vote, the right to go to school, the right to choose where we live, the right to not be told where we have to work or where we can play by an oppressive government. But the government can't give us freedom from, well, freedom from drugs if we're a drug addict. It can't give freedom from alcohol to the person who comes home from work exhausted every day from trying to climb the corporate ladder and the first thing he or she does is pour down three or four drinks. Freedom from alcohol doesn't come from the Bill of Rights. Freedom from poverty doesn't always happen to people who live in a free country. There's thousands of families in our community where children wonder where their next meal is going to come from. It's why the open arms ministry exists and continues to grow. There are still people suffering from poverty, even living in a free country. The freedom given to us in our Bill of Rights doesn't free the politician from being chained to a desire for status or power or the zealot from being chained to ideologies that are harmful to themselves or others. The freedom we get from the Bill of Rights doesn't free the cancer patient who has to go once or twice a week and literally be tethered to an IV to receive life-saving but also debilitating chemotherapy. The freedom given, from our, given in our Bill of Rights doesn't free 
the mother or father from grief over losing a child. The child from grieving over the loss of a parent or a husband or wife grieving over the loss of a spouse. The difference between the kind of freedom given in a wonderful country like America, and I am so grateful to live here, but the difference between that freedom and the freedom that comes from living in Christ is that every obstacle we continue to face, even living in a free country, will eventually be overcome. Joy will come in the morning, no matter what the addiction, what the affliction, what the hang-up. When that glorious day comes that we see Jesus face to face. And that's why I focus on this freedom. The aha moment comes when we begin to understand that redemption doesn't mean a trouble-free life but it means none of these troubles can separate us from God. Paul continued to write in chapter 8 of Romans some words that I really, I am sure I heard them before this particular situation, but I remember really focusing on them when I first came to St. Paul many years ago. There was a young man who used to attend St. Paul. He was older now. I happened to know his father because his father and I worked together in the property appraiser's office for years. And then I got a very terrible call at work. I was still the property appraiser at the time, learning that this staff member, who I love dearly, that his son, who had been a member of St. Paul years ago, had committed suicide. Interestingly enough, the year prior, another staffer of St. Paul had lost, uh, not uh, St. Paul, of the property appraiser's office, had lost a child to suicide. But that child's church would not allow her to be memorialized with a funeral in the church because they considered suicide a sin. On the other hand, because of what we Methodists believe about grace and God. I heard Pastor Bob at the service for this young man who had taken his own life read the following scripture, and I hope you'll listen to it closely because it provides what we need when we go through all the kinds of struggles that I mentioned a few moments ago. Paul wrote, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Say that with me. Nothing can ever separate us. From God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is worthy of fireworks. (laughs) That is worthy of fireworks. Redemption, though, requires us to do something that we are terrible at doing in America, in our culture. It requires us to persevere, to be patient, and to take the long view. We are a society that loves instant gratification. We can make instant purchases with the click of a button on our phone. We can communicate instantly, even when we would be much better off to count to 10. We want instant results. We even want instant mashed potatoes, for heaven's sake, when we know that there's nothing quite like boiling real potatoes and mashing them up with more butter than is good for us. 
But we are society that loves instant gratification and our culture clashes with this idea of how we are to see our own redemption. I'd like to share some real life stories with you about people who are redeemed. One from the Bible and two from our congregation. The first person I want to talk about is Paul, who was born Saul, who was well-educated, arrogant as could be, a persecutor of Christians who weren't even called Christians yet. They were followers of Jesus, known as the Way. He was powerful. He was a religious leader. And yet if you read in the Acts of the Apostles the story of how Saul became Paul, you'll find out that Jesus knocked him off a horse when he was riding a horse one day on his way to persecute Christians and blinded him in the process. He had scales covering his eyes. He was humbled and brought low. And the rest of the story is, after spending some time in quiet, suffering solitude... He was trained by the apostles, and he became the greatest church planter in church history and the writer of more of our New Testament than any other single writer. Oh, how the mighty fell into a redeemed life. But we can look closer to home to see a redeemed life. All we have to do is look at Yvette Carter. She runs our open arms ministry. Yvette will tell you, and I've talked to her about what I was going to say today. She's written about it in a book, and she's fine with me saying it. She was poor. She was abused. She was homeless. She had trouble with drugs. She went to jail, and she found Jesus. And in that case, oh, how those who had hit rock bottom were raised. Today, Yvette Carter has to go to the doctor periodically. To be tethered, like I mentioned, to an IV for treatment for cancer. But Yvette Carter is the freest person I know. And if you know her, you know what I'm talking about. But you know, it's not always a spectacular fall or an incredible rise that marks being redeemed by Jesus. Last week I had the occasion to talk to Ellen Stance. Many of you know Ellen. Ellen was someone who was raised in a home where Jesus was at the forefront. She went to Sunday school. She read her Bible. She learned her scriptures. She married a godly man. They poured into the community. They poured into their family. But Ellen didn't have one single spectacular moment where she was knocked to the ground like Paul or raised from the streets like Yvette. You see, sometimes we're redeemed by a process that's more like slow and steady, wins the race. And Ellen exemplifies that. And the lessons from these lives ought to teach us that real freedom isn't found in power or status, but also that there is nothing bad that can happen to us that can keep us from being redeemed by Christ. There is nothing that can happen to us that won't eventually be overcome by God. But also that transformation for one person may not be what it looks like for you. We're all redeemed in a little different process, depending on our circumstances, our personalities, and our gifts. You know, I hope that you have a blast, literally, today, (laughs) celebrating the 4th of July. We have so much to celebrate our liberties, our rights, the freedom to vote, the freedom to live where we choose, the freedom to work as we wish. But this one-day celebration pales in comparison to what we celebrate at Easter, which is everlasting and can overcome all the things that earthly powers and principalities cannot provide. We shouldn't discount the blessings of liberty. That is not my point. If you know me, you know I'm a veteran. You know I spent Memorial Day at Arling National Cemetery. I love our country. I love our country. 
but I also realize her limitations, and she has some. She can't keep us from some of the struggles that come. I believe that most of us have been blessed beyond measure, but we need to remember that not everyone is blessed in the same way or blessed equally, especially people who don't have the benefit of living here in this nation. In contrast, everlasting freedom in Christ is available to every single man, woman, and child in the world. It's a freedom that surpasses all other freedom. And it seems to me that sometimes we keep ourselves from accepting that freedom because we think we're not good enough or because we have doubts and we think if we have doubts, we're not worthy. And I'm here to tell you today that God can handle your doubts. Jesus makes you worthy. And if you have not already said, yes, Jesus, yes, I want you to be my Lord, the 4th of July would be a great day to find real independence. So as we sing our closing hymn today, I'm going to invite any of you in this room who have never accepted Jesus as Lord to come forward. You don't have to come up on the stage. I know that feels very conspicuous. I'm going to come down to the floor with Felix. We're going to be just in the vicinity of the first row here. Come forward. We'll pray with you so that you can accept Jesus as your Lord. If you've already accepted Jesus as your Lord, but you know you have been far away from him for a long, long time, and you just want a prayer to get reinvigorated in your relationship, you can come forward too. Today is the day we celebrate independence, but there's more than one kind of independence. Will you accept the independence that comes from loving and following Jesus? I hope so. You know, we sang a hymn before I began this message. This is what the last verse said. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless I stand before the throne. That's what today's about. <laughs>